So you should have worked on the fast start activity, unit four, lesson six, part two, recursion, the return. Get it? The return, because that's what we're going to talk about today. Is the returns of recursions methods. So far, we've been talking about recursion methods that don't return anything. They're void. So uh, in this lesson, we're going to look at methods that return an actual value. The process of recursion is really not that much different at that point. Instead of just printing something out, it's going to return a value to the previous calling method. So let's take a look at some code. We have our method. It's public static. It returns an int. Instead of being void, it's returning an integer, returning some number. By the name someone, it should be clear that I'm adding things. I'm using descriptive methods here. You want to start getting in that habit of using descriptive method names, not just method A. That's something a little bit more descriptive. And it takes as a parameter an integer. So this is where that vocabulary word where we talked about parameter versus argument is going to become important because we're really talking about both those things inside of this one recursive method. So if n equals equals 0, we're going to return 0. That is the base case. When n equals 0, we're returning 0. That's our base case. That's what's going to stop things. So if they put in a 50, 50 is not equal to 0. So we're going to return, but wait for it, 50 plus the sum of 49 is the argument. So the new argument here is 49. Someone is now called with an argument of 49. This return statement cannot complete until this method completes. So it kind of sits in memory, just waiting for it to get a value from this. So this method is called, let me cycle back up to here, so now the argument goes into the parameter, int n is now 49. 49 doesn't equal 0. So we're going to return 49 plus sum, that's calling the argument, 48. And we keep going through that process. So the 48 goes into as the parameter, not equal to 0. Return 48 plus sum of the argument, 47. All the way down till we get to, let's jump ahead to 1, right? n equals equal to 1 plus sum of the argument 0. 0 does equal n. So we're going to return 0. After the first return 0, the next place that Java goes to is the method that called this method. Right? It's the link. So it goes to really this line. But it's returning 0. The value that's here is 1. Because that was the previous value. It's 1 more than the 0. This is n minus 1. So 0 was the argument. We know 0 returns 0. So this is now a 0. And we get 1 plus 1. So it returns excuse me, 1 plus 0. So it returns 1. So this is now done. This method call is now done. Return run. We go back to the previous method call, which was here. Sum n, is n minus 1. Right? So now we know it's returning a 1, and n must have been 2. So we do 2 plus 1 is 3. And so forth and so forth. It's going to cycle back through this kind of structure here, going up from each level in memory. And sometimes it's easier if you draw out what's really going on here. 
every time we call someone, a block in memory is created. So this was called when the argument started out being 50. Then the argument is 49. Then the argument is 48. These are all versions of someone. Dot, dot, dot. We get to zero. Zero returns a value of zero to the previous calling method, which had an argument of one, which returns a value of one to the previous calling method, which had a value of two, and so forth, all the way back up. And each one of these is returning some value all the way back up. So imagine the value that's being returned is like a slip of paper. It's passing off that slip of paper from one method call to the next method call to the next method call. And every time that slip of paper is passed, the value gets rewritten to something new. Because they're taking the two sums and adding them together, and then they pass it off to the next person. So if we go back to our stairs example, where we're walking up the stairs, or not walking upstairs, but talking up the stairs, how many people are in front of you, when we start returning that value back down, instead of returning it verbally and the person turning around and saying how many people are in front, they wrote on a piece of paper and they returned it to the person behind them. And that person raised that number, added one, returned it to the person behind them. That person added it by one and returned the person behind them, all the way down until they find out how many people are there. This is essentially the code to calculate the number of people that are in front of you. Right? Essentially adding up, well, actually, no, that's not what it is. It's adding up all the values between 50 and 0. It's adding them all up. Make sense? We talked about this method already in uh, the last lesson. This returns a value of 1. This is our base case. It's factorial. So when n equals equals 0, we return 1. And then each time we're going to multiply by the previous value. So it's n times factorial n minus 1. So the new argument becomes a value that is 1 less and goes back up to the parameter. So let's just take 5, real quick example. So we start with 5. 5 doesn't equal 0. So we're going to do 5 times factorial of 4. The argument is 4. 4 comes up to here. A new memory block is created with a, a parameter of 4. 4 doesn't equal 0. So we do 4 times factorial of 3. 3 is the argument that goes up to a new parameter. A new memory block is called, and it's factorial 3. 3 times factorial 2. 2 times factorial 1. 1 times factorial 0, but factorial 0 does equal 0. 0 does equal 0, so we return a 1. So then this is now a 1 times 2. This is done. Now we come back to the previous method call, one level up, which is now here again. Another instance of it. There's another mirror of it, another copy of it, like a clone. I mean, like the clone wars. This is a clone. So we now do three, um, 2 times 1, which is 2, times 3, which is 6, return to 6, times 4, which is uh, 24, times 5, which is um, 98. Did I do that? Right? No, 96. Okay? So that is factorial 5 going through a nice recursive algorithm. You could write this as a loop easily, right? You could do a for loop and just count down and just do the sum of each one times itself, right? And keep a total, a running total. Total equals total times n, or i, whatever you use at that point, and just go through. All of these loops can be done with loops as opposed to using recursion. It's recursive coding is a looping structure. 
Say that again. Recursive coding is a looping structure. So you don't need to worry about saying, oh, well, I have to use recursion. No. Recursion, though, does become nice when your loops become too complicated. Suppose instead of just returning one thing, I had like five or six different possibilities of returning. Like if it was an even number, I would return a sum. If it's an odd number, if I turn a product, if it's a multiple of seven, I subtract six. And then, I mean, you could have like all types of crazy different values there that you are sending back to the previous instance. That would be really tough to do inside of a loop. You'd have a very complicated loop doing that. So this simplifies some things. So here's another example. Um, this is really a very interesting example. Take a couple minutes, pause the video, look at this code, and see if you can figure out what the heck it's doing. You know, the high-level, 30,000-foot view, mom explanation, what does this code do? So if you look, you may not be able to figure out exactly how this is working, but there's some clues as to what it might be doing. You don't have to always understand the code exactly to figure out what it might be doing. And sometimes the way they name things helps. I'm not happy about the way they named this method. I would have picked a different method. But it prints an int. So you know it's supposed to print an integer value. You know it's taking two arguments. One of them's called a base. So right away you might start thinking about, oh, bases. Well, that could be some type of numbering system. Numbering systems are dealt with bases, like base 2, base 3, base 10, base 16, base 8. Those are all bases. Hexadecimal is base 16, octal is base 8. Those are all bases. It looks like it's doing some type of division here, n divided by base, but it's integer division. So it's checking to see if uh, it divides in evenly. And it always sends the base. The base always goes with the method. So that's going to be consistent. This is never going to change. It's always going to go with the base. There's better ways of doing that. But for now, we're going to set it as an argument. Then we're going to use this thing where we're looking at a character at, and this is doing a mod, n at base. So it's giving me the character at, but with a mod. In other words, the remainder of whatever n is modded the base. So we know the value is always going to be somewhere 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, dot, 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 up to the base. It's always going to be one of those digits. We also have digits here, a digit table they're calling it. This is what we're looking at, a character at the digit table. And our digits are 0 through 9, but then we have this A, B, C, D, E, F, which Again, should be a clue that we're talking about some type of base arithmetic because base 16 requires an F. It goes 0 through F. Base 10 goes 0 through 9. Base 2, 0 and 1. So all the digits for all the possible bases, in order to express any number up to hexadecimal, is 0 through F. So let's talk about how do we go ahead and use this to understand bases. Well, when you run your code and you try it out, and the code's in the, pro, the uh, Blackboard, you can download this and try it. When you enter a number and you enter the base, it gives you a value, 200. So 512, base is 16, is 200. So 512 in hexadecimal is 200. 24 in base 10 is 24. 64 in base 2 is 1 with a whole bunch of zeros. 256 in base 8 is 400. So this is converting everything to the appropriate base. So it's taking some decimal number that we enter and a base, and it converts our decimal number, our base 10 number, to that base. 
It's very useful. So we should pause at this point and talk about bases. We've never really done this yet. How do you calculate a base? What does that really mean in other number systems? So ones and zeros are usually pretty basic. So I start with threes. Everybody does ones and zeros. But I'm going to do base three. It makes you think about it a little bit more. Base 10 and base 3 function exactly the same way. They have place value. Every place value in base 10 is a power of 10. Every place value in base 3 is a power of 3. So if I have the number 200 in the hundreds position, also known as 10 squared, we have a 2. So to calculate this, we know that the value is 2 times the place value. So it would be 200 plus 0 plus 0. Let me give you another example of base 10. Let's say I did 376. Well, you guys did this back in like fifth grade. Little did you know in fifth grade that you were learning how to count in any number system. They just didn't explain it to you that way. In fifth grade, you wrote this out in expanded form. You remember that? Where they would say, OK, 3 here is really represents the place value of 100, and we're doing 3 one hundredths. So it's 3 times 10 squared, which is 300. Plus, 10 to the first is 10. That's the tens position. We're going to do 7 times 10, which is 70. Plus, 10 to the 0 is a 1. It's the ones position. So we have our base values, right? This is 100. This is 10. This is 1. It's our place values. So then we do plus 6. And we add them all up, and we get 376. And you probably look at it and go, wait, that's silly in fifth grade. Why are we doing that? I know 376 is 376. Why do I need to write it out as 300 plus 70 plus 6? That seems silly. It is. They didn't finish the story. I'm going to finish that fifth grade lesson for you now. The other half of the fifth grade lesson, which they didn't tell you about, is you can do this with any base. Instead of it just base 10, this is the ones position. This is the threes position. And that's the nines position. Just like this is the hundreds, this is the tens, and this is the ones. I know all of a sudden your brain is like going, wait a minute, that makes sense, but it shouldn't. So used to place value being hundreds, tens, and ones, right? Hundreds, tens, ones, thousands, millions, billions, all that. Place value, cool, no problem. This is the same exact thing. This is the ones place value. This is the threes place value. And this is the nines place value. And just like we converted by doing two times excuse me, doing 3 times 100 or doing 2 times 100, we're going to do 2 times 9. That's 18. Three times 0. 0. One times 0. 0. So in our base 10 system, this has a value of 18. 200 base 3 is 18 base 10. So now I can do any base whatsoever. 
Converting from the base to base 10 is actually pretty easy. It's the other direction if it gets harder. But if you think about it, to convert from base 3 to base 10, it's multiplication. So to convert from base 10 to base 3, it's probably some form of division. And that division is integer division. And then you take the remainder. So it's integer division and modular division together. Because you, when you do your division, you have some left over. That will be the next place value. And you guys did that too. When you did long division in fifth grade, right? You did, you, how many times is this divided into this? What's the remainder? Go another place. Every time you divided it, you went another place. Little did you know, long division was exactly the same process of converting bases. They just didn't tell you that. I'm not going to make you guys do all the math and convert bases. Nobody ever does. But I just wanted you to understand you know, how this works. And I might have you do some practice today, but it's not going to be something I test on. It's not on the AP exam, but at least converting is. But understanding the relationship between bases and numbers is important for the AP exam as well as for everything you do in computer science. Just understand the relationships of numbers. Because in computers, computers use base 2. So if I do 1, 0, 1, and I'm base 2, this is 2 to the 0, 2 to the 1st, 2 to the 2nd. Or this is the 1's position, the 2's position, the 4's position. It's the place value, 1's, 2's, and 4's. So I do 1 times 1, and that's 1. 0 times 2, and that's a 0. 1 times 4, and that's a 4. So 1, 0, 1 is 5. Binary 5, binary in 5 is 1, 0, 1. Let's convert it the other direction. Suppose we had... base 10, and we're going to go to base 2. See, this starts at base 2 and goes to base 10. So to do that, the opposite operation would be some type of division. So if I start with the 5, and I say, all right, how many times does 2 squared Go in the 5. One time, right? OK. What's the remainder? 1. How many times does 2 go into 1? 0 times. What's the remainder? How many times does 1 go in the 1? We just converted it to binary. So the process is division. This is what our program, our recursive program, is doing. It's doing division. We did integer division, and then we did a mod, essentially, right? Integer division, and then said, what's the remainder? What's left? Integer division gave us this answer. What was left gave us that answer. Like I said, I'm not going to ask you guys to do this by hand. You have calculators and things for that. It's just having an understanding of how the bases work. And if you want to have a deeper understanding of this, you can find tons of information on how to convert bases back and forth. It's a very interesting math. Not something that you guys will learn any other math course. It's a very interesting math. OK. So on the AP exam, important to note, they may not say it's recursive. You have to identify the method as recursive because you'll see it call itself. They won't say, hey, this is a recursive method. You have to be able to identify that for yourself. They may ask a question, what's the output when the value 6 is passed into the method. Inside of Blackboard, you guys have some practice assignments. 
Here's the code that we looked at. Here's an exit ticket and a practice assignment one and a practice assignment two. So I want you guys to work on those for the next lesson. Never stop coding.